There's anger in Morocco and it's directed at the man at the very top of the United Nations. After Ban Ki-moon described Morocco's presence in the contested Western Sahara as an occupation, the government in Rabat now wants to cut its support for the UN mission there. Has the UN's position actually changed or was it just the Secretary General's personal view on a sensitive topic? And how will the Western Sahara conflict be affected? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. United Nations diplomats, in fact diplomats in general, usually choose their words pretty carefully. However, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is probably wishing he'd been a bit more careful when he chose the word occupation to describe Morocco's presence in the Western Sahara. Ban used the word after visiting a Sahrawi refugee camp in Western Algeria earlier this month. Since then, there's been a bit of backpedalling. The UN said that the comment reflected Ban's, quote, personal reaction to the deplorable, deplorable conditions those refugees have been living in for more than a generation now, in fact. But the terminology has inflamed the Moroccan government. They say the UN chief has abandoned his, quote, neutrality, objectivity and impartiality. So then Ban Ki-moon met with Morocco's foreign minister, perhaps a chance to draw a line under the whole thing. Not exactly. Ban instead expressed how angry and disappointed he was at both the government's reaction and the street protests you're looking at now. Massive crowds of Moroccans marched in Rabat on Sunday to denounce Ban's remarks, many of them encouraged to do so by political leaders. Morocco has now said it will cut back on staffing at the UN mission in the Western Sahara, which is based in that disputed territory and it's threatening to pull its troops out of the United Nations peacekeeping missions worldwide. Now you're possibly wondering at this point why there's been such a big reaction to this. Well the answer is rooted in the origins of this Western Sahara conflict. So I want to take you through that. It goes back to 1975 when Morocco took control of the area after colonial power Spain withdrew. Its inhabitants are known as Sahrawis, a distinct cultural and ethnic group Many Sahrawis wanted nationhood. They began an armed resistance in 1973 under the banner of a liberation movement called the Polisario Front. The separatist war with Morocco dragged on until 1991 when the UN brokered a ceasefire. And as part of that deal, Morocco was supposed to hold a referendum in Western Sahara to decide whether it should become independent. The Rabat government, meanwhile, encouraged new populations to move into the territory. I say, though, that referendum has never happened, and a more recent Moroccan plan for regional autonomy hasn't happened either. So that sets out the story. We're going to get the thoughts of our guests now. Let's introduce them to you in Rabat. First of all, is Samir Benis, who's the editor-in-chief of MoroccoWorldNews.com. Uh, we go to Athens for Christos Satsoulis, who is a former UN peacekeeper and field commander in Western Sahara, so he'll give us a unique perspective. And in New York, Khan Ross is the executive director of the consultancy group Independent Diplomat, and Khan has actually acted as an advisor for the Polisario Front, so again, another interesting perspective to come there. Gentlemen, great to have you all with us. We thank you for your time. Samir in Rabat, let me start with you. The word occupation. It is a contentious word at the best of times. Did Ban Ki-moon misstep, do you think, by using that word in the first place? Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here to speak about uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, I think, uh, the, as many uh, observers think, uh, the, the use of the word occupation is a flagrant violation of uh, first of uh, international law, of the UN practice, and of the, the mandates entrusted uh, to, to the Secretary General by, by uh, the Security Council. Since ni for, for uh, over three decades, all UN resol resolutions adopted by the Security Council or the General Assembly or other entities, none of them ref refers to the conflict or to Morocco as a country that occupies the, the Sahara. The Sahara is, is considered as a non-self-governing territory, and Morocco is the main part of it, as, as is the country that, mm. that, that, that has the territory and, and their, its sovereignty, although it is not rec recognized by, by the UN. So uh, for, for, the United, for the UN Secretary General to go to, to the Tindof to, to camps and to use this term and also 
to add to add insult to injury and to to you to refer to the self determination that shows that he he did not only overstep his his mandate and violate uh, violated international law but he showed bias uh, for for the polisario as uh, as so a you chief, think UN that chief, as a as, well, his, was, uh, his role this is what I was going to ask you. As a UN as, chief, as you, should he not have a personal opinion? He should, it should be more nuanced than that. As a UN chief, he, use, he should be guided by neutrality and impartiality and steer away of any, uh, of any word that could uh, uh, escalate tension or expand it uh, between, uh, between the parties. Mm. Uh, the, the use of the word occupation, uh, UN Secretary General cannot, uh, cannot uh, uh, use his uh, personal opinion. He represents the whole United Nations. Mm. He cannot, he's not like, he's not like, any, he cannot, uh, he's not representing uh, member states. He should uh, stay, steer away from expressing bias for any of the, of the parties. Okay. When, he, when he used the word occupation, he clearly showed what uh, party he stands for. Right. Khan Ross, let me bring you into the conversation and, from New York. Uh, and I should, just I just, should hold, add, just I should hold add, on a moment for I me, please, add. Samir, because I do want to hear from our other guests as well. Khan Ross, let me come to you. Maybe, here's an idea, Ban Ki-moon did it on purpose. He knew what the reaction was. He knew he was expressing an opinion that would bring uh, a, a reaction like that, but he was fine with that. Well, Ban Ki-moon chooses his words carefully. I think he's known for that. And in contrary to the recitation of Moroccan government propaganda that you've just heard, I think we need to be clear what has happened here. The Secretary General has drawn attention to a dispute that has gone unresolved for a generation and has left 150,000 refugees in terrible conditions in the middle of the Sahara Desert, desert for a, a generation. And the reason for this is because Morocco has blocked negotiations as it is required to undertake by the Security Council. Your previous speaker expressed outrage at the use of the word self-determination. His own government has accepted that there needs to be a mutually acceptable solution based on the principle of self-determination. That is clearly reiterated over and over and over again in the Security Council resolutions and was reiterated by the Secretary General during his visits to the Tindouf camps. The fact that Morocco has gone hysterical over his use of the word occupation is an attempt to distract from this central issue and is utterly consistent with Morocco's propaganda over this issue for many years, where it has constantly thrown up smoke and distraction to try to distract people from the central fact that it has refused to negotiate over the future of this territory as it is required to do. I have been following this dispute for many years, mm. not only as, an, uh, as a member of independent diplomat, but also as a British diplomat sitting on the Security Council. I've known every personal envoy for the Secretary General for several, several years, and each one of them has told me that Morocco has essentially refused to engage on the substance. It has, blu it has shouted bluster, it has shouted insults, this time at the Secretary General, which I think is an outrage and needs to be condemned very loudly by the Security Council itself, only to distract from its central refusal to do what it is required to do by the Security Council. Samir, I will let you answer uh, those uh, claims just quickly and then we'll bring Christos in. Christos, I haven't forgotten about you, don't worry. Samir, let's hear from you. First of all, if we're, go if we're here on this debate, we have to avoid using words such as, such as propaganda. Because I am here, I am not representing Morocco, I am, represent I, am, I am an expert, I have studied the issue for 25 years. So please show respect to others. We are here debating as intellectuals. We are not here debating as, as, uh, as uh, diplomats or as uh, Polisario versus, versus Morocco. I am here debating as someone who has, who has been observing this for 25 years. So uh, I, I, and here I come to back to, to what you said about uh, uh, referendum and self-determination. I have to put things into context and, and tell you that, we, that, first of all, in 1991, when the Security Council adopted the settlement plan, the settlement plan the settlement plan was for, has a procedural flaw. Why? Because, because although Morocco and Polisario accepted to go ahead with the plan, in principle, they had so many uh, reservations. And they conveyed to, the, these reservations to Isa Diallo, who at the time was entrusted by, uh, by the then uh, USG uh, Perez de Cuillar to lead the task force to, uh, that was uh, in charge of preparing 
the, the settlement plans. But the problem is that the Isa Diallo did uh, neither transmitted the Morocco's reservations to the, uh, the, to the Security Council to the, nor, nor to the other members of the task force. So here, here, this shows clearly that, that Morocco and Porizelli will never, never agreed on the same interpretation of, of the settlement, settlement plans. And here, I should quote uh, uh, Javier Perez de Cuyar, who at the time was SG. In his memoirs, he says, I was never convinced that independence promised the best future for the inhabitants of the, of the Western Sahara. And before the adoption of the plan, Paris de Cuyar was convinced also that the settlement plan could, could, not, could not meet the aspirations of the Morocco and Polisario, and, and, uh, and uh, compromise so, so should, be uh, should be sought by, by uh, both parties. Okay, and, Samir, uh, when Samir. James Becker was. I, I, I'm going I'm to interrupt. Just now, let me interrupt just because this. we've got a lot to get through, and, and I know you've got a lot to talk about there, but I do really want to bring Christos Satsoulis in because he has been waiting there uh, in Greece and can give us a, a different sort of perspective, I think, as well. I wonder about this Moroccan government government reaction because they're threatening to pull out their forces from uh, from the Western Sahara and from other UN peacekeepers. Wouldn't this almost backfire against them, sort of, um, you know, undercutting themselves? Uh, so from personal experience, the support provided by the Moroccan government to the UN mission, uh, to MINURSO, it's absolutely vital. So if the uh, Moroccan government uh, are serious, uh, on um, going on one step uh, further and really withdraw their uh, support. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the UN mission uh, in Western Sahara can actually uh, live, live, live any longer. Uh, even, even beyond that, beyond that uh, I would say that um, the actual uh, everyday support we had from uh, the local uh, Moroccan military commanders mm was uh, also of uh, high value and you know um, in everyday operations in such a uh, harsh really harsh mm. environments such as the sahara desert uh, such kind of uh, cooperation is is crucial so even even i can imagine that even if uh, moroccan government does not withdraw its support officially but mm. simply states an order uh, down the chain of command uh, to their local commanders, ordering them, uh, okay, gentlemen, now you are going to support them only by the book. You, mm. you will support the UN only by what is explicitly written in the book. Uh, believe me, I wouldn't like to be present as a UN peacekeeper mm. under such as, as, uh, a situation. Can, can you tell me, Christos, more about the force itself? Because you supervise the ceasefire, you've led patrols for the UN there, you've been on the ground. I want to know more about the, the size, the strength, the effectness, effectiveness, I'm sorry, of this force uh, in, in its job. You know, from, uh, from a point of view, the conflict, the, I mean, the actually the military part of uh, the conflict in Western Sahara has actually been uh, frozen mm. for at least... 20 years now. I mean, there are no, there have not been any kind of uh, hostilities, of actual hostilities between the belligerent parties uh, since uh, 1991. So, uh, this is the the pleasant, let's say, uh, part. So, practically, the military part of the UN mission only supervises uh, the written terms uh, on the ceasefire. We were not uh, engaged uh, in any other kind of. Uh, uh, activities uh, including for example humanitarian aid or something like that but mm. I'm strictly speaking about the military yeah. part of MINURSO mission. Okay let's bring Khan Ross back in from uh, New York because something Christos said there struck me he said there's basically been no military action there's been no hostilities uh, for years now but you pointed out as well that there's been no movement either on the the diplomatic front as well maybe this whole issue of one word occupation uh, at least that brings it up into the spotlight again we're talking about it on this program here if it's a stalled uh, process maybe it gets a bit of airtime now and people actually hear about it and understand that there is a a, a, a frozen process there effectively well, I, I agree. I'm glad that it is being talked about, though I, I regret the, the focus on one word, because mm. what we should be talking about is the fact that the process has not moved at all. There has been, as the previous speaker 
uh, uh, described a ceasefire since 1991, agreed between the Frente Polisario and the government of Morocco. But the clear basis for that ceasefire was that Morocco would allow a referendum for self-determination of the people of the Western Sahara. That referendum has never taken place, as you said in your intro mm. introduction. And that is for one reason, which is because Morocco has refused to allow that referendum to take place. There have been endless rounds of talks and repeated envoys from the UN who've tried to, to make progress, but the essential fact is that Morocco has blocked that progress. And why? what Ban was doing with this visit was to point out why this mm. was happening. He went there deliberately to draw attention to this. I know from his office that he is deeply frustrated by this issue. He does not want to leave office as Secretary General, which he will leave at the end of this year, without mm. there being progress on this dispute. He feels some personal responsibility uh, for this issue. He feels, I think, the UN's shame that nothing has happened over this dispute. 150,000 refugees have, have lived in these refugee camps for 40 years since the original Moroccan invasion in 1975. The population of the Western Sahara, the indigenous population, live under political repression, as repeatedly reported by international human rights organizations. This is a travesty and a dis disgrace, and it should not be allowed to continue. And Morocco should not be allowed to continue to make excuses for this lack of progress. I hope that this drama will bring political attention, above all from the Security Council, to get this process moving and oblige Morocco at last to come to the table and discuss how mm. to allow a referendum as is required under international law. Right. So, Samir, I want to ask you about that. And it's, I want to ask a very pointed focus question here, just on the fact that, as Khan points out, there has not been a referendum when there should have been a referendum. Tell me your view on why there has not been a referendum, because we can't well, dispute that fact. Uh, well, I am, I am not going to talk based on what uh, some diplomats told me in the UN. I am going to talk based on what... Eric Jensen, who was the head of UNORSO between 1994 and 1998, arrived to uh, after, after four years leading the, leading the, the, the UN mission. In, in, his, in his book on the Western Sahara, Eric Jensen said that uh, because of, uh, of uh, lack of uh, agreement of, on voter eligibility, the referendum was unworkable, in addition to the fact that the settlement plan was flawed since the beginning, since it did not take Morocco's and Polisario's reservations into account. And, and I have to, to point out here, to, to set the record straight, straight that, that since uh, resolution 1754 of April 2017, the option of referendum was ruled out. And starting from 2007, just the year when Ban Ki-moon came to office, the Security Council adopted the resolution that's called on the parties to strive toward reaching uh, uh, an agreed upon and mutually acceptable political solution. And all observers agree that any political solution should rule out any, uh, any solution where one of the parties uh, is, uh, lo uh, is losing. And uh, there, there is unanimity among academia that, uh, that concepts of self-determination, as was promoted in the 1960s, cannot be implemented in today's world. We have to come up with, with innovative solutions. Sorry, and Morocco, is profoundly in 2007, misleading what came, came up is saying. with a proposal of this autonomy not that, true. Was, that, that, that was hailed by, 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 by the Security Council as, as a serious, credible, and realistic, uh, and offering the basis for reaching a political solution. While when the, the counter proposal of the, the Polisario was, was just was, was not hailed by the Security Council, the, the Council only hmm. took, took note. Of that, of that counter proposal. Okay. And since then, until 2015, all Security Council resolutions repeat the same, the same uh, paragraph uh, while just taking into account the proposal of the Polisario. This shows okay. that Samir. there was implicit support for Morocco's pro pro uh, uh, proposal since 2007. Samir, I feel that uh, you and Khan could probably have a conversation on your own here. Maybe I'll give you each other's email addresses after the show or something like that. But Christos, let's bring you back in as well, because we shouldn't lose sight of the fact of the people here. You know, we can talk politics and diplomacy as much as we want, but you've seen on the ground, I guess, the conditions for the people there, the situation there, and people who are waiting for something to happen that just, just hasn't happened. Tell me more about that. Uh... 
more or less it is exactly as you as you describe it mm. uh, people are living in, in um, refugee camps in the desert in extremely harsh conditions uh, and I'm, I'm not sure they have actually something to expect I'm, I'm, I'm quite sorry saying that and because uh, unfortunately I regret to say that I think that this uh, unfortunate uh, wording recently used by Ban Ki-moon will be grabbed, and I, I think we were already witnessing this, will be grabbed by the Moroccan side and it will be used as a further excuse to keep the situation as it is, frozen. Uh, let me point out that, uh, to my opinion at least, mm. in this situation, time works in favor of the Moroccan side. Mm. Definitely. I mean, it's been a long time I mean, already, Morocco, though, hasn't Morocco, it? We're, we're, we're 2016 now. The ceasefire was way back in the 90s. How long, how long exactly, can they hold out? Exactly. Moroccan, Moroccan are not uh, in any hurry. They're not in a, in a hurry. The, the, the side that uh, really is in a hurry is the Saharawi mm. and the Polisario side. Pol Polisario fighters, I mean, military speaking again, uh, um, I quite doubt if there are still actual mm. Polisario men or women in uh, fighting age. Polisario fighters are dying. They are dying out simply of age. Mm. Simply time passes, they're getting older, they're removed. And um, the new generation, the, the Saharawi youth, let's say, uh, they don't seem present. They don't seem present uh, Again, military speaking, you do not meet young Polisario mm. fighters in Western Sahara. Okay. There's no such a thing. Let it's an oxymoron. Okay, let's start to sum things up because we are starting to run out of time. Khan, let me come back to you in New York. We've pointed out numerous times that this is a frozen process, that nothing's happening. Wh who or what could kickstart it if not the United Nations? Is there uh, African Union? Is there na are there neighbours who could mediate something to kickstart the whole thing? Well, interesting that you mentioned the African Union because they've begun uh, begun to become much more vocal about the issue and demand that it be resolved. But the world community is clear that this belongs uh, under the mandate of the UN Security Council. And the UN Security Council has been pretty clear about this, that there needs to be progress. And unlike your speaker from Rabat, what the Security Council actually says is that ne there needs to be a mutually agreeable solution on the basis of self-determination for the people of Western Sahara. That is not an easy thing to agree upon. I accept that. But there does need to be real talks. And that is what Ban is saying, that there needs to be real talks about this. I don't really see what is so unreasonable about mm. demanding that Morocco come to the table and talk about an issue where people have been left suffering for so yeah. long. As, a, as an individual, as mm. an independent person, as a hum humanita humanitarian, the situation is unacceptable and intolerable. And Morocco should be obliged to come to the table to talk about it. So Samir, I've got 40 seconds left, so let's keep it brief. Real talks is what Khan says, and he's right. Someone's got to start talking at some point. Mor Morocco has shown its, uh, its readiness to talk since, since the beginning, and that's why it came, it came, uh, with, uh, it came up with the, with the autonomy plan. And autonomy plan offers, offers one, one, one of the, the options uh, enshrined in international law for self-determination, which is autonomy, according to a resolution uh, 26, uh, 25 of October to, uh, 1970, uh, the autonomy could be a, a solution that preserves the rights of the, poor, of the, of the Sahrawis to, to exercise their right to self-determination. And that's, that's where the, the UN and Maki Moon has failed. Because someone has failed for nine years, I have no hope. It would be wishful thinking to, to, to think that Ban Ki-moon and Christopher Ross would be able to help the parties achieve any progress. Ban right. Ki-moon and Christopher Ross are not the right people to achieve that. We'll leave it there. Samir Benis, Christos Satsoulis and Khan Ross, we thank you very much for uh, this discussion today on Morocco. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, please head to our Facebook page as well, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Conversations on Twitter as well, at AJ Inside Story is our handle there. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon.